Joe Garden was born in Chicago and raised in rural Wisconsin. Garden started at The Onion in Madison, Wisconsin in 1993, which makes him quite old. Cre <laughs> he created the characters of Jim, Jim Ancho Chower and Jackie Harvey. He is currently features editor where he oversees popular features such as American Voices, National News Highlights, and Stat Shot. In addition, Garden has co-written two episodes of a PBS educational cartoon, Word Girl, as well as three books as a part of the writing group, Action Five. Wisconsin native John Crewson started writing for The Onion in 1991, making him slightly younger. While still in college, after realizing <laughs> that would laugh, come. <laughs> after realizing he was neither active nor impartial enough to work in journalism. Today, he holds the title of sports editor and contributes to the main paper as well. In addition to his onion writing, John has somehow managed to occasionally moonlight as an automotive road tester, although this has not yet led to any uncomfortable comparisons to Jay Leno. So welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Joe and John. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, just wanted to clarify two things. Uh, the, we are not currently, we were never owned by Comedy Central. Um, we, there was some business talk and uh, it fell through. Uh, we are still entirely independent. Uh, me more so than uh, some other people. Um, so yeah, uh, so there's no, we have no corporate, uh, we have no corporate, uh, uh, overlords to say what we can and can't say. Uh, therefore, you can expect a string of uh, very racist tirades later on uh, as this evening progresses. Uh, secondly, uh, we also have a questionnaire for you to fill out in the back of the room. Uh, we would appreciate, I mean, we'd appreciate more than 60%, obviously. Uh, just a simple questionnaire to let you know, rate us as, we, as speakers and as write onion. How, rate the onion as how it's doing, uh, just your name. Uh, phone number, uh, mother's maiden name, uh, social, social security, security number. Right. Uh, you know, a couple uh, credit card and, uh, you know, some... Uh, Dates you'll be out of town for more than three days on vacation. Uh, uh, favorite pet's name, street you grew up on, uh, and... Uh, Anybody else's social security number you happen to know besides your own. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, how cute you think we are. Um, on a scale of very to really. <laughs> Uh, a third thing we should clarify, I am slightly older than Joe, not slightly younger. By two years. <laughs> I'm a spring chicken. <laughs> I'm an old bastard. <laughs> so uh, one of the big questions, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, that just sort of wandered in off the street, uh, uh, you might want to know, uh, we just should probably clarify, what is The Onion? Has anybody, has everybody here read The Onion before? Raise your hand if you haven't read The Onion. If you haven't read The Onion. Okay, okay what the heck are you guys doing? Are you <laughs> Uh, okay, well, to clarify, The Onion is a satirical uh, newspaper. Sasha, we turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Um, no this, the Onion is a uh, satirical newspaper, and depending upon who you ask, uh, you'll get uh, two different answers as far as what, our, what the, the Onion's background is. Uh, so to provide the, uh, I'll be providing the, uh, if you ask The Onion, you'll get the following answer. Uh, in 1756, a German immigrant, uh, Friedrich Zwiebel traded the sack of yams for a printing press and started his newspaper, The Mercantile Onion. Mercantile and onion were the only two words of English that he spoke. Right. He didn't even know the word the. That was just sort of luck that he stumbled upon that word. Uh, in fact, it's funny because it was missing all the S's, and that's uh, how he began the craze of uh, using F's for S's uh, back in old typography. Uh, Sorry, th that's our salt. Right. Uh, in 1783, the mercantile split off from the onion. Uh, in a disagreement over allowing advertisers to control the content uh, for money. Uh, the Onion was f very much in favor of controlling content, for letting uh, advertisers control the content for money. Uh, the Mercantile had some sort of journalistic standards. Um, we were clearly far ahead of our time. Right. Uh, then in 1896, uh, his great-great-great-grandson, T. Herman Zwiebel, took over as the editor-in-chief, uh, a position he held until 2001. Uh, <laughs> You would think he passed away, but no, he actually uh, was launched into space. Uh, By his evil robot manservant, Mr. Tin. Right. It's uh, all in the archives. You can find his first-hand uh, editorials. Right. 
he periodically does, will, he will contact us from space with uh, various sort of missives, uh, such as, uh, can't you sell more ads? Uh, why aren't you selling more ads? Uh, put a banner ad on that, uh, things like that. Or good job when we have a particularly large and obtrusive ad. Um, and then uh, 1992, the Onion Radio News was founded. Uh, and then from 19, uh, or 1922, the Onion Radio News was founded. Uh, 1923 to 1999, it was a period of prosperity and un unprecedented in recorded history for any newspaper or any other business for that matter. We opened up a, uh, an Onion in Milwaukee. Right. And, uh, and a sub shop Speaking in Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, it was very briefly lived, but it was still very good. Uh, PJ's Clubs and Subs, oh, fantastic. Free smells. Um, and then uh, in 2009, uh, we hit a little bit of a roadblock. Uh, in 2009, the onion was briefly purchased by a, uh, I believe it was a... a salvage fishery and adhesives corporation. Right. Uh, it was a Chinese salvage fishery and adhesive corporation called Yuan Mei. And uh, so we were briefly uh, owned by foreign, uh, by foreign concern. Uh, but fortunately, we, uh, they found out that the print industry is dying, and so they sold it. Uh, uh, one week later. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we were, once again, we're still independently owned and operated. Uh, it was terrible. They made us print the most outrageous lies. Right. <laughs> Such as uh, China Strong. And uh, It Fish Time. Right. <laughs> Salvage fisheries are big on when is fish time, which turns out to be all time. All time so. is fish time. Uh, uh, robustness is unavoidable. Uh, I just can't get that slogan out of my head. So, but, the, uh, but then I turn over, uh, turn over the real history to uh, Mr. John Cruson. Um, the real history is, of course, one of the same kind of struggle you find in any uh, American corporation. We started out very small on a college campus, and now we're very small in New York City. Um, <laughs> that's known as a success story. Uh, we were founded in 1988, uh, as uh, the good doctor told you, by Tim Keck and Matt Johnson. And did I get those names right? I always mix up. Tim Keck and Matt Johnson. Tim Keck yes. and Matt Johnson. If they're listening, hi guys, we miss you. Yeah, what are you doing watching Come public back. television? You're very <laughs> successful now. They sold it a year later to, uh, uh, for an undisclosed sum, but very small four-figure sum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to uh, Scott Dickers, who became the publisher then and um, was for many years. Uh, we had many uh, false starts in the world of business. We opened up a... Uh, a second onion on the campus of Champaign-Urbana in northern Illinois. Not exactly a thriving metropolis, but a beautiful, yeah. a beautiful town. Another However, beautiful it was followed by a big success because in 1993 we closed our office in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, <laughs> uh, which was a huge leap forward for our company. Um, at that time, we were still more of a weekly world news kind of tabloid kind of thing. There were a lot of... Uh, it was basically in Madison, Wisconsin. So there was Monster of, uh, of Lake Mendota, the big lake there. Malls Madison, and with a kind of, you know, Loch Ness Monster kind of thing. We uh, thought that alliteration was very funny. Uh, it, back it worked then. for the Weekly World News. We didn't realize that we were trying to satirize a satirical parody publication, which is kind of a false start. Uh, but still, there were a lot of coupons for pizza in it. So, right. And we're here today, so it must have been doing something right. We had a 50-foot Anby Davis monster overturning local... Uh, institutions and university buildings. Amby Davis played the maid on the Brady Bunch. Case, uh, now you know the rest and, of the story. Yeah, so, uh, and, and that brings us to today. Wait, no it doesn't. <laughs> In 1995, we decided that this uh, Weekly World News thing was not working out, so we styled the paper more after USA Today, um, which made a lot of people instantly think that we were USA Today, because if anyone uh, is familiar with USA Today, it's kind of, uh, you know, a self-parody in and of itself. So, <laughs> and plus, as soon, as soon as you see a colored graph, instantly that buys you credibility. So uh, for those of you that are working in any sort of a journalistic fashion that want to get a little bit more credibility, put a colored graph on the front page. Or if you're just writing a, 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 you know, some sort of socialist screed that you're handing out on the street corner, a tri uh, you know, a graph always looks very good. They were the first people to add pi to charts, therefore making them more popular amongst the burgeoning middle class. They were called um, round charts before that. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. The word pie chart, you know, instantly made you want to know what kind of sunscreen people are buying. Um, in 1996, we went on the internet uh, with our first website, which was actually, if I remember correctly, kind of protested among many people on the Onion staff who didn't understand what it was or how it would make us any money. <laughs> Today we know exactly what it is, and we still don't know how it's going to make us any money. I remember, but, I actually remember thinking very distinctly at the time, it's like, why would anybody look at the Onion on the internet? People get their news from newspapers. Exactly. I mean, who even owns a computer that they can just take anywhere with them? 
Right. But uh, until I can read this on a on a on a on a bus, I was taking the bus a lot at that time. I, until I'm taking this on the bus, I don't want to take it. Uh, I don't want a, a an internet version. In those days, <sighs> if you had a portable phone, it came with its own satchel. Remember. <laughs> yeah. Also, Miami Vice. That was a great show. Anyway. Um, so there we are on the internet, not knowing how to make money. Uh, wait, that's today. <laughs> uh, and we know how to make money. You click here to see the rest of the naked lady, but we don't have many naked ladies. So, <laughs> um, in 1999, uh, we decided to cash in on the trend of millennial books and release The Onion's Our Dumb Century, uh, which became a New York Times bestseller um, to our great uh, delight and surprise and our minimal profit. It, uh, in case you don't own it, um, that is wrong. You should run around and buy it. It's uh, the history of the 20th century and onion front pages, including such headlines as WA with a big R on the second page uh, when World War II begins. Uh, earthquake celebrate, uh, San Francisco uh, celebrates least gay day with earthquake. Um, um, world's largest metaphor hits iceberg, the Titanic disaster. Um, and there's one we can't about the moon landing that we yeah, can't really say uh, on the radio or in church. Yeah, uh, people swear so. a blue streak because they can't believe they're on the uh, cursed moon. Uh, yes. I, I wish I had some sort of device that would actually enable me to beep every, everything. I'm sure so they do a WBH so we can just start swearing. <laughs> I mean, I used to watch Zoom. That thing blew. Oh, there was smoke on the floor of my room. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and in 2001, we leveraged the success of our book and our failed deal with Comedy Central into moving to New York anyway, where, where we always wanted to go if we were bought by a major corporation <laughs> and had the money. Turns out we didn't have the money, so we moved anyway uh, to New York, where we immediately were deluged with dozens of opportunities to do exactly the same thing we'd been doing in Madison, but in a much larger city. It costs a lot more money to live in. It costs a lot more money to live in, and there's a very competitive newspaper industry, and we got into a knife fight over advertising with the Village Voice that shows no signs of stopping. It's right. uh, overall a really bad move. But hey, we're in New York, so that's what's important. Um, <laughs> go Yankees. I didn't mean that. Um, well, frankly, I don't like him. them either. I, was, I grew up a Packers fan, and if there's two franchises that are any more opposed than the Yankees and the Packers on general principle, I don't know what it would be. Well, for one, is one's a baseball team and the other's a football team. That would well, make yeah. them oppose. And um, one is funded by the community, and the other one is funded by an evil Grecian shipbuilder. Um, I mean, he actually understands a lot more about sports than I do, so I shouldn't have been correcting him. I, uh, that doesn't mean I understand a lot about sports. <laughs> no offense, Joe. But, it's okay. Uh, and uh, 2007 and eight, we launched the uh, Onion News Network, which um, is our probably self-destructive move to stamp out literacy in our lifetime by taking our humor and putting it onto a medium where you don't have to be able to read. Words are overrated, so, at, least, uh, at least the written words are. Yeah, I understand that they hardly ever get writer's cramp at all on their side <laughs> of the operation, so that's good. So that brings us up to the present day, uh, except to the fact that we have now um, come as close as we're ever going to get to getting an honorary degree from Harvard by standing here and talking to you. Right. So, so this, is, this, fulfills, uh, this fulfills a lifelong dream of mine to, to, give, uh, to speak in close proximity to, though not necessarily at, Harvard. So... Yes. Uh, they did used to have the national lamp the, the Harvard Lampoon here. They did at one point, they so that was good. <laughs> and to, well, they still do. Not really. I know they do. Yeah. They, well, I think Andre Andre Nishida, our former uh, former the guy fellow. we fired. He, he didn't get fired. He was uh, he, Andre Nishida was not fired. He was uh, not fired. Um, anyway, boy, that's really we nearly tarred and feathered him once we found out he had written for the Lampoon. <laughs> just not done. Anyway, I, uh, I just got thrown for a loop there. I didn't know what to, all of a sudden I felt myself getting very defensive for Andre. <laughs> um, so anyway... Uh, you're a good guy, Andre, if you're out there. If you're listening, please. Please, uh, please, Andre, forgive us. Uh, anytime people discuss Andre, they always use that, that, that sort of stereotypical Eastern European voice. Um, anyway, uh, so basically what we do, uh, you know, The Onion has, has made its stock and creative sort of, uh, uh, you know, as a parody newspaper... Uh, making, uh, basically making jokes at the expense of uh, religion, uh, contemporary figures in popular culture, uh, political figures, uh, respected institutions. Uh, is there anything in this? Everything. Fat people. Fat people, thin people, uh, blondes, brunettes. Uh, people have too much or not enough sex. <laughs> Generally, um, lazy, apathetic Americans in general, and of course the media itself, which is a big one. On our list, right. So uh, as we like, we do that. We have like several. There are several different ways we we do that. In uh, we have several different uh, sort of tools that we sort of uh, work at. 
uh, we sort of exaggerate, there's the exaggeration of behavior, for example. Uh, in order to uh, sort of make fun of something, we'll just pick it, uh, we'll pick it one, uh, one specific uh, target about them and just sort of blow that up, uh, such as uh, King of Pop, Dead at 12. Um, Our Michael Jackson obituary. Yes, which was a little sad. Uh, I have a little, I believe, I, do I have it here? I'm afraid I don't, actually. But it was a very sad and poignant story. And if you, uh, if you read it, you'd, you'd well up with tears and laughter at the same time. That's how, that's how deeply moving it was. It was fairly tributary, actually, I have to say. Yeah, it was um, a lot really kind, considering all... I mean, I think the problem... I think the thing with that is that uh, everybody had spent so much time making sport of Michael Jackson, and he became sort of like the late-night pinata of, of joke-telling. And so it was just like, you know, it was sort of time to give it a little bit of a rest. And then the next day, we actually ran a timeline where we made all of our cheap jokes. But that was our nice... That was our one nice thing we had to say about Michael Jackson. Yeah, everyone likes to imagine Michael Jackson when he was 12 or 14 and then just really stop. You don't want to think about much <laughs> after that. You want him to have recorded Thriller at 14, and then that's it. Right. Uh, probably another great example of exaggerating someone's behavior in a very blatant way in order to make very simple satire of him was um, one of our most quoted headlines from Bush's uh, inaugural address, which was Bush, colon, quote, uh, our long national nightmare of peace and prosperity is finally over. <laughs> and um, did we have that printed out? or? Oh, you know, this is embarrassing. I don't have that printed out. Yeah, but he talks about the nightmare of the Clinton years with its untold economic growth and uh, mostly global era of peace as being over. He promises to embroil us in a foreign war within three years. Remember, this is early 2001. And that, uh, and that he would tank the economy the way it's meant to be so we can go back to the glory years of Reagan when uh, there was gross economic stratification and mistrust among Americans. And... Um, that's known as being really lucky and prescient at the same time. <laughs> so that worked out really well. He was a hard president to satirize, actually. People say, oh, you must have had a great time with President Bush in the office, but he self-satirized so many times. I mean, <laughs> his cabinet was shooting people in the face. He was walking into locked doors. He was, he was dropping his dog. He, he was, was choking on a pretzel. It was, uh... Oh, that was the other Bush, I think. No, wait, no, he choked on a pretzel. His dad threw up in Japan. Right. <laughs> because the Japanese automakers made him nervous. Um, <laughs> Overall, it's a great family. Uh, but, um, yeah, so he was actually hard to make jokes about, but we got really lucky with that one on very early. Right. So. And that was often, often quoted uh, by... Tom uh, Friedman loved to quote it all the time, which is nice. If you're going to be quoted by somebody all the time, Tom Friedman's a good one. Yeah, amen, so. amen to that. Uh, one of the other tools we have is the, uh, as opposed to the exaggeration of behavior, we have the, the inversion of behavior. Uh, where you sort of, uh, you know, you make, you, you take, it's also known as the switcheroo. You got a guy and you make him do the opposite. That's kind of funny, right? Um, it throws his actual behavior into sharp contrast. <laughs> and as always when discussing comedy, I feel like an idiot. Talking to you, you must feel like I'm an idiot. Speaking to you as if you're idiots. But it's actually harder to pull off than you might think. When we, when, again, Bush was hard to make fun of. So early on, we had Bush doing things like finding errors in Fermilab's calculations. Uh, <laughs> Delivering an impromptu but brilliant oratory on Virgil's minor works after a state dinner. <laughs> and generally not choking on things or dropping his dog or walking into locked doors. Um, I got to tell you, I didn't like him very much. Uh, but I was one of those people who, like, because he didn't like the president, didn't want anything bad to happen to him because I didn't want to react in a gleeful way. And every time he walked towards that helicopter, I was like, oh, don't. Please duck. Please duck. I don't want to feel the right kind of joy. If something happens in Marine One, just you know, it was it would not have made me feel like a good American. So. Right, and then after after September 11th, when it became uh, when uh, suddenly there's a whole new focus on the president, uh, people stopped making the the dumb jokes. I guess that's when we could have started making the dumb jokes, but we opted not to. Uh, for a while, it was uh, we started making a, a, a there was a series of jokes we were making. Uh, uh, the economy was tanking, so Bush on the economy. Uh, we'll invade Iran or Iraq. Uh, this is before he invaded Iraq. Uh, and then yeah. it's like, Bush on North Korea, we'll invade Iraq. And that was his, uh, that was sort of the running joke. Yeah. He was just going to keep on like... Then every... he spoiled our joke by going and invading Iraq. Right. And that is the worst thing that happened during the invasion of Iraq. That is the biggest crime possible. Right. I will never forgive him for many things, but ruining all our jokes about him, probably, uh, I think everyone will agree, the worst thing he ever did as president. Ooh. Well, that and whatever the hell he did with education by making everyone take tests. I don't understand what that's <laughs> all about. Uh, so, yeah, there's, a, there's another... Uh, uh, one of the other inversions we had was uh, recently uh, 
uh, it was uh, Lou Dobbs Deported, uh, <laughs> in which uh, Lou Dobbs, born, uh, born in Mexico, uh, Luis Dominguez. Oh, was, Colombia, I thought he was. Of, of Colombia, right. Yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he was sent with his uh, family of, of 12. Uh, he came here on, a, on, on the top of a bunch of bundles of cocaine in the hold of a cigarette, cigarette boat <laughs> in the early 80s. And when they raided his home, they found a sweatshop churning out fake designer goods and a thriving lawn care business that he was uh, presiding over. I think the actual picture of him had him in a sombrero or something just ridiculous. I think that's the great thing about Photoshop. Uh, yeah. You can put a sombrero on anybody. Yeah, that's uh, the great, I mean, but inverting someone's behavior is great. I mean, um, I, the, the regular news does it too. I mean, it's not just us inverting someone's behavior. The regular news likes to point out that many staunch anti-homosexual lobbyists uh, of the religious or conservative bent are actually gay. But that's in real life, so that doesn't really count, although it's still very, very funny. That happens? Oh, yeah, there was a guy who went to Europe and took a bunch of boys with him. Well, he just took, what, it, was a, it was a porter. He took a guy to carry his luggage. Come on, let's be fair. I mean, it's very hard to find good help. Carried and, his uh, luggage. You know, you need to, if you're looking for a good uh, porter. His luggage had wheels on it. If, if you, if you're his luggage good, had all his things in it. <laughs> If you're looking for a good porter, you can't just look in the normal spots. You need to look in the uh, gay interest websites. You pay websites. the extra luggage charge. <laughs> um, so then we also do our very... Like, I think he was having sex with them, too. He, I'm sorry, you were saying? He may have had sex with them. We don't know that for sure. And if he did, it was to, between two consensual adults, one of whom was, very, was much less hypocritical than the other one. True. Um, the, uh, we also do a lot of... Uh, we don't do... One of the things about The Onion is we don't do a lot of very of the moment jokes because uh, we're not, I would say we're not, uh, we lack the sort of live nature of a, of a real news organization. We're also very lazy, so we don't want to stay there until like three o'clock in the morning writing a news story to put up the next day. We have done in the past when uh, the 2000 election was hanging in the balance and Florida was in doubt and everything. We did a whole issue about how the US was plunged into chaos and there were tanks in the streets and the Naderites blew up a dam and uh, we quoted uh, um, Bob Dole as saying, Bob Dole's been shot. <laughs> Clinton declared himself president for life. And that, that day, we stayed up until 2 in the morning make, just remaking that issue. But that's very rare we can do that. Right. But the, uh, it's funny because the issue before that, which was actually came out on election day, uh, just segued perfectly into it and it, without even intending to. Uh, because we, you know, are, we're, we're published the day, you know, we go online and in print the day after the election in any given uh, presidential election year. Uh, it always, uh, it, we, it, that particular issue was Bush or Gore, a new day dawns. Uh, and it was basically treating it like it was the same person who had won, except for it was just like Bush or, intended, instead of saying the name, it was just a like Bush or Gore. And it just worked out perfectly to, uh, to segue into that. Uh, so history, uh, history smiled on us on that day. Yeah, because now we can pretend that's what we meant, and I think looking back at it now, saying that Al Gore and George Bush were the same person, that doesn't work so well. No, they're uh, kind of different. You're saying life was so much simpler when I was uh, when I was 30. Wait, no, 28. No, wait. Stop. What year already. was that? Oh God. I don't know. I was only 37 then, or something. <laughs> oh, I was 30. But yeah, I remember going to see Gore speak in complete sentences and thinking there was no difference between him and Bush, and wow, that really didn't bear out. Oh dear. Anyway, uh, if we could turn back time, like we, we do jokes. We uh, do funny jokes. One of the things we do also is we, uh, you know, the onion. The onion itself uh, is, you know, while we write a lot of stories about about people, one of the big uh, conceits of the onion is that the onion is itself a clueless news organization, and uh, we are sort of uh, we're mean, we're vindictive, we are advertiser based. Uh, we're clueless. We don't care about the reader, and uh, we. And that's like that becomes sort of the character of the uh, of the onion. The uh, the onion as a character is great because it has no compassion. It's opportunistic, and it's all too willing to parrot people who are also ignorant, lack compassion, and are opportunistic. Um, so sometimes you know, and it's a great way to to you know poke fun at the media itself, which is getting harder and harder for reasons that we have already hit on, but. Right. Uh, some of the examples for that is a uh, black man asks nation for change. That was our Obama begins his campaign right. thing. And it, it, on the face of it, it looks like, if we, okay, that's one of those things that if we hadn't carried it off right, we would have looked really bad. 
But the whole idea was that people didn't understand who this black man was, why he was quoting the Bible and, and um, speaking in a very loud voice in major cities and wanted change so bad. What will he do with this change if he gets it? What if we don't want change? Or what if we don't want to give him this change that he wants? And the, the closer is brilliant. It just says, I think this guy should stop yelling about change and get a job. <laughs> so. And then we also have uh, uh, other, other things where the, the, uh, where the, we just play with the news voice itself. And uh, usually what we try to do, we try to make the, uh, the one thing uh, that makes uh, our jobs difficult is that you may have a lot of very fun jokes, but you also have to present them in the, in the driest possible form conceivable, which is the AP, sort of like an aping of the AP news style. So everything has to be done very, very plain and very, like, everything has to be done in the inverted pyramid, which is a word I only know because uh, when I we work here, yeah. Because we work at The Onion. But, um, uh, but we also, like, sometimes we like to play with that. And we like to, like, it's fun. You can't do it a lot, but you, like, you, it, you get to break the news voice. Uh, and one of the stories uh, we recently ran was, uh, sometimes area woman just feels... And that was the story. It just trails off. It's, it just trails there's, off. There's an ellipsis there. Um, yeah. Undefined terms are really fun to put into journalism. There, uh, Because, you know, journalists only do it by accident and then feel bad about it. When we do it, it actually makes it very funny. Right. And a lot of the stuff in Area Woman just feels, just comes just short of a conclusion and then stops. So. Well, and there's also the, uh, I'm trying to find the exact, I don't want to get the, head, the headline wrong. It was a... Uh, Oh, here we go. Uh, it was yours. Middle, uh, Mideast conflict intensifies as blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> the kind of story you've read a million times and you could finish it yourself, so why don't you just? And so on and so forth, and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, troops were poised, on the, were, were poised on the border between... Uh, uh, <laughs> while people stayed at the table until uh, in the morning trying to come to a compromise with Al... Uh, Tensions for up ben is, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, wake me when it's over. Right. But, yeah. So the Middle East, uh, a barrel of laughs. <laughs> and again, note that I, that's not a joke about the Middle East. That's a joke about the readers' attitudes, your attitudes towards the Middle East stories. And also the the newspapers, the the, the interchangeability of the you know. Of exactly. The, Very boilerplate. Right. So. so that would, I think that's a good introduction to the, uh, to the paper itself. That's generally and not specifically what we do. Um, we also do stuff that's not always up on its high horse. Right. I just want to point out, we'll, we're not above uh, running a really stupid joke like, uh, like what, what are some? Oh, I can't think of We've been trying to think of how just... smart we are all day, and now we can't remember what we do the other 80% of the time. Uh, oh, here's one, an ed editorial. Excuse me, but I'll ha be handling the gentleman's discourse for the rest of the evening by a bottle of whiskey. Uh, oh, one of the stupidest ones is uh, the, tech, the tech columnist we have. He's only appeared twice. He's not like, you're not expected to know who he is, but his name is Beepo, uh, a dolphin. And uh, he reviews, the, uh, he reviews the, the new technology, the, the iPhone, the iPad, you know, the new tablet t computers, except for uh, they all start out in very dry tech speak, and then he takes them underwater, and he gets very angry because they don't function underwater. <laughs> There's no real point to that. It's Brilliant like social satire. <laughs> That's what makes us great. That's why we won the Thurber Prize. Right. Anyway. Um, oh, and Michael Phelps returned to his tank, uh, tank at SeaWorld. Fantastic. Yes. Exactly. Uh, good sports headline. Why, well, thank you. We have a couple. We also did Tiger Woods announces return to sex. When he... <laughs> Lots of golfers here. Um, <laughs> when he had his... We, we brought it up just when he was doing his... Uh, his uh, press conference announcing how very sorry he was that he had, you know, done all these things that he seemed to really enjoy doing, if I'm reading it all correctly at the time. Uh, but, um, although kind of vanilla, if you ask me. Anyway, um, yeah, we, we ran that, and, and it was just more frank and everything, and, um, and uh, God, we love Tiger Woods. He's such a great character. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, maybe we should bring Sasha up, and she can uh, start prying us with some prizing us uh, with our questions, picking in yes. our brains. As if it anyone were. else wants to play the piano during the transitionary moments, <laughs> I really think that was so far the highlight of the evening. That was fantastic, want... by the yes. way. I'm very appreciative. Yes. Uh, Magnificent. So, as you both know, I'm a child psychiatrist. So. This is going to get personal. I need to know some developmental information. <laughs> You've taught us tonight how one writes satire, what satire is made up of. 
but I wanted to know, were you born this way, or did you have to learn to be this way? It's my own birth for, uh, for laughs. <laughs> okay. I think we're, I mean, I, I think it's both. I think you, you know, I don't think you're really born with it. I think you just sort of, I mean, I, I think everybody kind of grows up with a certain dis, uh, discomfort around authority and a certain discomfort. I mean, I, no, I was going to say everybody grows up with a certain discomfort around other human beings, but no, that's only a select few. Here we are in a church. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. We're just going to adjust this momentarily. Okay. Um, how's that? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, I, I think, we, you know, we were, you sort of develop a sort of discomfort around authority figures and you just develop a distrust of authority figures. Uh, and when you're only reading material, uh, when, the mo when most of the reading of material around the house is stuff like uh, a Doonesbury anthology and uh, punch cartoons from the 1950s, uh, you really sort of, it really sort of tends to, to push you in a certain direction, I think. So at school, were you funny? I mean, did people... I was not. I was the class clown. And everyone knows the class clown is the least funny person. I really, God, if anybody there out there went to high school with me, I'm really sorry that I was trying to be the class clown all those years. <laughs> I uh, did a lot better when I just sat back and was thoughtful. Um, I wanted to be, though. Uh, obviously, I'm not... I don't really have a gift for performance. Um, so writing was where I actually felt like I actually found my groove. And um, I had the attitude where I wanted to be funny, and I think I wanted to be funny about the right things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really think that funny is something that I ever, I've known Joe um, even longer than when you were writing for The Onion, I think, and Joe's always been a joy to be around and a funny person. Uh, I am not. I am dour. I'm kind of angry a lot of the time. And uh, I don't know. Any comedy I encountered growing up that I loved was mad magazines that I wasn't supposed to read or uh, late night TV I wasn't supposed to watch. So there's always been a subversive element there for me, mm -hmm. which is good because it keeps it exciting. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know. I think comedy comes from a lot of different places and different people. It does so. beg the question then, um, you said you didn't feel you could be impartial enough to be just plain old journalist. Um, how did you both decide to use comedy as the the, the venue for changing the world, as I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> when I decided to change the world with my comedy, uh, no. I actually decided to change the world with my vote, and when I realized that wasn't working, uh, <laughs> I decided to go for comedy, and so far it also hasn't worked. Uh, so I think I'm going to uh, become a mad supervillain and develop uh, some sort of laser, uh, orbital laser device. It'll get uh, people talking. It'll get people talking. That, I think that can actually change the world. Uh, I think we, I, you know, it's funny because I, I think I got into comedy by default. I've never been a, I mean, person, I know that it's funny because there are a lot of people that are, uh, now we're, in, we're, John and I started at The Onion when it was very, in its, in its, it wasn't in, in its infancy, it was in a toddlership or whatever you would call it at that point. Uh, you know, but we, it, uh, it was this many. It was this many. <laughs> so, uh, for those listening on the radio, John held up three fingers. <laughs> uh, but he, but so anyway, but we got involved in it because we wanted a, a creative outlet and The Onion was the creative outlet in Madison that we most wanted to be involved with at the time. Um, I was, I personally have never been uh, terribly ambitious. Now there's people that are terribly ambitious whose goal it is to work for The Onion, and I feel like that's sort of a weird thing, personally. Because um, <laughs> I was like, really? You want to? Yeah. Because uh, I'm just a, you know, I, you have so much talent. Why do you want to? Actually, I did say to somebody, he's like, well, I'm thinking about going to med school. He was a writing fellow at The Onion. He's like, I'm thinking about going to med school, or I'm thinking about maybe a, uh, Maybe I should uh, just, just keep writing for The Onion. I was like, you know, the world needs more doctors than it does it needs more smart asses. So, yeah. really, he, he does, however, school. he does, however, still work a little bit with comedians without borders. So that's <laughs> good. <laughs> he goes and and where people are starving or in need of, of irrigation and, and does stand up. <laughs> so good for him. good for you, Dr. Morrison. He, a rubber chicken in every pot. That's his. Uh... <laughs> but he. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so I didn't 
think about it as a means to change the world when I started at The Onion. God, I actually no. just thought mm -hmm. of it as something, something fun to do. It wasn't, the, the Onion, when we started it, when we started there, we didn't start it, um, was, like I said, more of a weekly world news kind of thing. It was an alternative to the other campus papers. And it was just comedy, and it was fun, and it was a bunch of people who knew each other more or less. And, and um, it took us a while to understand that when we did hard news stories, they were actually more popular and more meaningful and more media and that we could actually get a little more traction out of them. But it was never the kind of thing where you're like, oh, I'm going to change the world, but how? I mean... Madison was full of people that tried to change the oh, world yeah, and are, I, now, are now investment bankers. <laughs> yeah, lawyers for AIG or Pepsi, true story, both of them. Uh, oh, and, then, and don't forget uh, the one uh, editor at the Daily Cardinal who was the, uh, the socialist single mom uh, whose father was the president of the New York Stock Exchange and uh, is now uh, working for sports, uh, as a VP of a sports team. The Florida Marlins. I oh, right. Anyway, uh, obviously all these people were on the leftist paper. <laughs> because uh, they hated their parents and wanted to, you know, control their means of production or something. But um, uh, the Daily Cardinal is an advocacy journalism um, student paper uh, on the campus of the UW Madison. Very well regarded. Has turned out some brilliant people. Um, uh, Anthony Shadid's book, um, when, when, when Night Falls, I think. Is one of the is one of the Pulitzer uh, and um, uh, is a great example of daily life in Iraq during the occupation. And he was at the time he was like the the news editor of the Daily Cardinal, who uh, uh, you know was very frank about whether or not someone had the chops to be a journalist there. And I guess he should know. So it's not like good stuff doesn't come out of campus papers. I mean, I think that's where most journalists come out of, and there are some very good ones working today. Um, however, for us, that wasn't it. I mean. I realized early on I did not have the disposition of a journalist. I want there to be journalists. I think they're more important than I am. And I think I'm very, very important. So, <laughs> so there's that. But I mean, and without them, we don't have a job. If someone's not out there writing big, long, intense, thoughtful, very lucid, and very brilliantly written stuff for The Economist, I don't get to, you know, uh, you know crank out 500 words on Tiger Woods having so sex again. Is there so. anything, despite what you've said, that you'll mock anybody, anything? Absolutely. It, like, For so, one thing, those stuck-up jerks at The Economist. <laughs> <laughs> but is there anything untouchable, like the Haitian earthquake? Would you leave that alone for no, a while? No, we actually did something about the Haitian earthquake. Uh, <laughs> I have a huge crush on Isabella Rossellini, and I'm uncomfortable making fun of her. <laughs> Because we're thinking one day she might actually read the paper and notice us. <laughs> she might. <laughs> you never know. Come on, guys. Um, paper's free, after all. <laughs> um, well, frankly, no. If they deserve it or if we can get some laughs out of it for a good reason, we will. We won't pick on someone indiscriminately. All our jokes have a point to them. And mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes, I guess, maybe even fool ourselves, but we try to think that everything we do is, is there for a reason and not just for sheer laughter. I mean, anyone can, can make a joke, you know, and there are tons of people out there doing it about... about people just being fat and lazy. We talk about why they're fat and lazy, and it's a small thing, but it's very important. And, you know, with Haiti, we actually, our story was about, uh, about how the earthquake uncovered this, this uh, heretofore unknown civilization known as Haiti, uh, where we're talking sort of about how, you know, because it's, but the point there was that, uh, you know, no, things have been going terribly in Haiti for a long, long time, and everybody was just sort of like, well, it's Haiti, what are you going to do? And suddenly this massive earthquake hits, and then suddenly people, that, then everybody uh, are, is uh, texting, uh, texting uh, $10 to Haiti. Yeah, if they'd have done that a long time ago, they would have been better off to do with the earthquake, for one thing. Right. Um, but which, okay, it's easy to say, but it's also worth saying that we tend to ignore places like this until something, some act of God happens. It's easy to figure out what you think about an act of God. I am anti-earthquake, okay? <laughs> and I don't think there's any of you out there who are pro-earthquake. And if you are, you can get the hell well, out of you here. You just wait a second before you start <laughs> blasting earthquakes, John. Here Christian. we go. Earthquakes all, all have a great part of the te grand tectonic scheme of things. There's always one. <laughs> And they think they're cool, you know? I but, am cool. My mom said so. <laughs> Joe's mom's cool. Um, but, yeah, so everyone's anti-earthquake, but not everyone is anti, oh, I don't understand the political situation in Haiti. I, that Papa Doc, maybe he's trying to do the right thing. 
Uh, it turns out that they're chopping people's arms off with machetes, and it's actually, you know, it's easy to be anti-earthquake. It's probably pretty easy to be anti-machete, too, but it's hard to know who to send your $10 to. Um, and, you know, if people put in the homework, maybe we'd figure that out before there's an earthquake, mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. So would, would I, I think I just said that we might have prevented the earthquake, which is not <laughs> what I meant. <laughs> I think, uh, I, okay, does, does anyone here now understand why I am not a journalist? <laughs> I think I've just il illustrated that quite effectively. To prevent so, further nations, uh, nations from having further earthquakes, please text $10 to the John Cruz <laughs> anti earthquake I also want to point out that I know that's not how earthquakes happen. <laughs> it's because you didn't pray hard enough. That's why they happen. So, I want to point out that Joe doesn't think that's true. Uh, <laughs> this whole satire thing is fraught with a whole bunch of complications. So maybe I don't know quite what satire is, but I, I was mentioning. I obviously be don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was mentioning before when I go through to the Walgreens to get something. You know, I look at the magazines, and there's one that's right out there saying 300-pound lady gives birth to bat baby, both <laughs> doing well. Is that satire, or what is that? That is parody. <laughs> <laughs> There is a difference. Satire is trying to exaggerate truths and make a point. Parody is saying, wouldn't it be funny if a fat lady gave birth to a mo baby monster? Mm -hmm. That would be a funny thing to look at. So, and, so, and again, it's not like we don't do both. But the Weekly know. World News, which is where the Bat Boy came from, actually did a fantastic uh, satire uh, in the, the form of their columnist, Ed Anger, who was this, uh, he would always start off uh, saying how he was pig biting mad about something or how he's mad as a, as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs or anything. And he'd just start, start and it would just be this insane, it was just beautifully insane rant about how uh, some, uh, some sort of like slightly left of center uh, or even centrist uh, uh, cause or uh, event in the news just had him so worked up. And uh, he's like, I was talking to my uncle, O.V. Potter, and he said, uh, you know, it's all, it, was, it was great, and that, that was actually fantastic satire. So, like, there is satire in, in things like that if you, you know, if you look past the Bat Boys and the, uh, and the, uh, the Martians meeting with, uh, or the aliens meeting with Clinton. Ed Anger was an early model for the brilliant comedian Bill O'Reilly, who was a, himself <laughs> a brilliant inspiration for the brilliant comedian Stephen Colbert, who inspired Glenn Beck. So we can <laughs> completely see the evolution of comedy. I'm serious. <laughs> About 75% of that. I think Bill O'Reilly's probably a, 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 a jerk. But I really think Glenn Beck is going to, I mean, come on, Nick, I can't believe all that stuff. Two years from now, he's going to be saying, oh, I can't believe I had you all on. Then he's going to burst into tears and condemn Mexicans. <laughs> I wondered if you wanted to talk about more of your ancestors. Like, you, uh, Joe, you talked about David Letterman, and I was thinking about Tom Lehrer, George Carlin. Do you want to comment on those? Or more of them? Well, I, you know, I grew up, uh, like I said, I grew up in, with a, a, a book of Doonesbury uh, from the 70s, so somehow by the age of 10, I knew, uh, I knew uh, who Henry Kissinger was and uh, had a vague idea of what he actually did. Uh, I know, knew about the secret bombings of Laos. Uh, <laughs> and then I also, you know, we had a book of punch cartoons, and, you know, fortunately... We, uh, we got public television, and we were watching Monty Python's Flying Circus at my house all the time, uh, which further warped me. I think you can even, though, go back to, like, even things like The Little Rascals. Like, watching The Little Rascals was something where was, there was a, you know, it was a gang of scruffy kids that were always anti-establishment, uh, anti and they were always, uh, and somehow they always came out ahead, which is absolutely untrue. The anti-establishment uh, underdog always gets squashed in the end, uh, in real life. But, uh, you know, it was a great fantasy while it lasted. Um, and I think, you know, there's other things. Steve Martin was a big, you know, for me, Steve Martin was a big influence. Uh, we had his two albums, Let's Get Small and Wild and Crazy Guy. And, you know, originally when you're probably 10, you're, you know, there's some adult themes in there and you're sort of giggling at the wrong words and you're laughing at the fact that he says, excuse me, but you think back and I look back at that and, you know, the, just the structure of his jokes and the just the weird absurdity and the, uh, you know, that was just, that was fantastic. Yeah, um, it was. Um, go ahead. That was very much what, what it was for me too. Is listening to stand up, which is something obviously I'm not involved in personally right now. Um, I still will involve myself personally by watching it, but uh, yeah, that's where it comes from for me. Is just anything that was funny. Um, Looney Tunes cartoons, every day after school. Um, Mad Magazine. I used to read joke books and be really disappointed in them because they weren't funny. <laughs> they really weren't. It's and true. You, the, we, I had, uh, you know, a thousand and one insults, which may have been funny when I was eight, but then, uh, 
yeah, but then as you get older, you're just like, there's nothing, this is just so hyper-structured, there's never an occasion where this will make sense. And then, you know, when I was, you know, my early teens, you know, early Saturday Night Live, which I thought was brilliant, um, now I think some of it was and some of it wasn't. Uh, it's really hard, I mean, there was no, there's no really clear evolution besides that I, I'm happy to say I tended to like the, either the really smart stuff or the really, really dumb stuff. I mean, there was a joke at a, uh, for a long time in the Onion office of how we sit around and try to be highbrow all the time and impress each other, but what really makes us laugh are the really stupid jokes. If you pitch a joke, and you know, we have headline pitch meetings every Monday, if you pitch a joke in there and everyone likes it, it's gonna be a brilliant headline. Everyone, everyone will nod and say, that's really funny, but they won't actually laugh at you. If you uh, make the stupidest joke possible about, like, if you, if you, like Joe likes to do spit takes in the meetings, or if you fall down or something, we'll laugh uproariously. That stuff's still funny. So. I was gonna do a spit take to demonstrate that I realized how inappropriate it was to do that in a church, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's happened here before, you know, but I'm not. During the witch trials. <laughs> <laughs> you think she's a what? I mean, I know it's the 1700s, but come on. <laughs> and 1600s. then what about um, responsibility in terms of, again. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm protected. I'm always responsible. No, if, if, the, if the Indian government misreads you or if something happens like that, do you feel like you have to think ahead as to how you may have an impact on international politics and crises? If we are having a huge impact on international policies and crises, this world is in a lot worse shape <laughs> than even I think it is. I, uh, what I she's think... referring to is... Yeah, yeah oh, go ahead. She was referring to an incident um, last year mm -hmm. when we ran a story about uh, Neil Armstrong being convinced that he never walked on the moon. He, he meets a, uh, a conspiracy theorist who tells him he never walked on the moon, it was all a stage set, and Neil Armstrong says, oh, that explains a lot. I now believe that the moon landings were faked. A Bangladeshi, a couple Bangladeshi newspapers picked this up and ran with it, and they called us then and said, oh, Oh, you guys should take this down because uh, it's really, it, it's, it turns out it's not true. <laughs> which we thought was, <laughs> which we thought was very responsible of them. <laughs> there was another one uh, earlier when we ran a, a silly story. It was actually about stadium referenda. Uh, Congress threatened to leave Washington, D.C. unless they got a new Capitol built. And they actually, the funniest thing is they threatened to leave uh, Washington, D.C. for Toronto, was yeah, it? Yeah, one of the cities was Toronto. It was either Memphis or Kansas City or Sarasota, Florida or Toronto, any place <laughs> where they'd be happy to have a large legislating body to draw a crowd and sell souvenirs <laughs> and seat licenses. And we ran a, a, a graphic with a brilliant retractable dome capital so that they could legislate in the open air and harangue each other on nice days, you know, like today's one o'clock day game, which almost made me late. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, the sixth largest newspaper in the world, I think, the Chinese uh, the Beijing, Beijing Evening News, picked it up and ran it on page five of their newspaper, complete with our graphic. They just completely <laughs> cut and paste our graphic into their layout. And when I think a Sacramento Bee, Sacramento Bee reporter called them up and said, what, why did you, this is from the end, and they're like, right. We know it's from The Onion. We think it's a disgraceful story about America. It's pretty typical. And I said, well, The Onion is a satirical newspaper. And they said, well, what's that? And <laughs> I think they actually... This goes back and forth for a while. And they're they, like, maybe you should check your facts. Yeah, maybe you <laughs> should check your facts. Maybe you should look up this Onion, see? Hmm? If, if, if they're wrong, then we're wrong. And <laughs> they said, well... So the retraction they wound up printing was, apparently there are newspapers in America who will run any garbage for money. And apparently <laughs> they thought this would sell papers, and we were duped, duped, we say, into running a false story that we didn't bother to check on even once. So. Uh, but we had the last laugh because the reporter who uh, turned it into the Beijing Evening News was shot. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, that pro I, that, that's, very, that's speculative. I'm just I mean, for a different reason. <laughs> for reporting on lead and toothpaste, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> I must say that when I told Joe and John that they'd be staying on the same street that um, is the street where Julia Childs lived, um, Joe told me that it was good news because they'd be doing a cooking demonstration tonight too. And I thought, my goodness, do I need to get a stove for them? <laughs> and I'm still waiting for the cookies. <laughs> oh, uh, but, uh, So I think, well, people it's... believe you. <laughs> Julia Child was a spy, too, which is the coolest <laughs> thing in the entire world. 
Which is why I've bugged this entire place. There's microphones everywhere. That's not a funny joke if I'm talking into a microphone. Why did I say that? Was funny? <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, well, we actually do have our chili. Uh, our chili are cooking in the back, and everybody is in, in, everybody's invited to come back and have some chili at the end of the, uh, the, uh, the presentation. Unless this is a hilarious mix-up with the, with the food group that's meeting back there. Right, the local know. vores. <laughs> the local vores, yeah. What are the local vores? What are they? I mean, the, the, I, I love the local vore movement, but what do you do in, say, early May when there's no, like, I guess. Yeah, and you live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, cactus again? <laughs> I have sand. Oh, look, sprouts, again. Anyway. Anyway, uh, I like locavores. Next question. <laughs> Just I'll ask one more, and then we'll open it to the audience. Okay. Um, this may be before your time, but, you know, Lyndon Baines Johnson lifted up his shirt to show his appendectomy scar. That's not all he lifted up to show people, <laughs> to no. so you know. Oh, oh my do you, goodness. Do you know about the, the, the story? The, the, it's, it's, it's apocryphal, but... Uh, How can we get this out? Uh, I think we can just say it, and they can bleep, uh, bleep whatever's necessary. Go ahead. Um, he, I think what happened is he was talking about, like, he was talking to his advisors, and they said, well, what gives you the, you know, we, they, it was, I think it was a, an advisor was saying, you know, what gives you, maybe if somebody else knows, they can chime in, correct me on this, it was like, what gives you the right to do this, what gives you the, what, the right to do this, and uh, Linda Baines Johnson, uh, you know, uh, is rumored to have uh, had a very large uh, penis, um, and so he basically said, what gives me the right, and he pulls out his penis, and Whips, and he says, this gives me the right. Yeah. This is not a story that I, uh, this is a st story that John and I have both heard independently, uh, and we did not make this up. Uh, this is, Apparently but again, he apocryphal. did that more than once, too. So, um, so Republicans didn't invent everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, there's also an interesting story in The Realist. Uh, well, Paul Krasner, speaking of Linda B. Johnson, Paul Krasner did a story once about Linda B. Johnson well, I'm not going to, well, I'm really not going to get yeah, into that Yeah, you're not going to tell that just, one. Just Google, just Google search uh, Paul Krasner, the realist, Linda B. Johnson. Uh, not I'm, after a heavy meal. <laughs> I, I, I guess one last, last question yes, yes. for me. Because we, we totally skirted around that question, I think. And, <laughs> yeah, I, and, and, I'm not and really sure what it was again. We opted for a dick joke instead, so. Anyway, yeah, Linda Baines Johnson. <laughs> do, you, do you think anybody could learn to be like the two of you? I don't know why in the world they would want to do that. <laughs> okay. I'm actually uh, offering you mean courses. As far as what's that? I'm offering courses. I mean, for about for. I mean, you can actually come for three thousand dollars. You can come live with me for a month, and I will tell you how to be like Joe Garden. Um, it means uh, hey, there's a, there's some perks. Uh, my wife's a great cook, uh, and you have two loving cats that'll hang out with you. Um, and then you know you get to sort of soak up the Joe Garden vibe that will really uh, sort of shape you as a, as a satirist, as a modern-day Jonathan Swift. I guarantee you will be a Voltaire by the time you leave my care for $3,000 a month. Limit, uh, limit five per month. I don't offer that. <laughs> anyone, right. anyone who wants to give me $3,000. As far as actually learning how to, uh, how, how to do comedy, we learned a lot of it. I mean, it's a, if you have the sensibility for it, I mean, uh, I encourage anyone to try it. I suppose, in your spare time. It's a great hobby. It's, uh, it's, it's enriched my life. Um, I think if you, it's one of those things where it's, it's such a strange job, it's such a strange industry that if you really want to do it, you're probably already doing it or trying to do something like it. You know, I mean, it's, it really is something that sweeps people up and it's, it becomes a lifestyle and there's its own little comedy culture, which is as, uh, as, as much a minefield as any other little uh, strange culture. Uh, like if you took up being a locavore or building your own canoes. Um, but I think this is much more important than either of those two. Uh, if you want to, sure. Just, you know, there's no one way to get into comedy. It's just going out and trying to do it. And I wouldn't recommend trying to start your own campus newspaper. Uh, it's, it's a miracle that we made it this far. <laughs> so. So you are at the Cambridge Forum, and I'd like to open up the floor to the audience to ask the questions because we have the luck of having Joe Garden and John Cruson here to answer your questions. Please um, do line up against, uh, yeah. come up to the mic, please. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot about Lyndon Baines Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the nature of your business, I'm sure, it skewers certain people. I'm wondering if you ever have had a bad uh, controversy 
with someone who felt uh, as though they have been taken. And also, uh, wondering if you watch uh, the, uh, the Daily Show. The Daily Show? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, don't have, I actually don't have cable. It's a true story. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, it's true, I don't. Um, I should watch The Daily Show, I'll admit that. But uh, as far as being, is angering someone who didn't feel that we were fair to them? Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people open the paper to see that we're are shown usually the paper and and see that we've made fun of them and don't like it. But I don't know if we've ever had any real feedback on it. I think uh, well, it's it's there is it is public knowledge that uh, Janet Jackson once tried to sue us uh, for a story we wrote. Uh, it was it was about a Make a Wish Foundation scenario in which dying child gets wished to pork Janet Jackson. Uh, that can be bleeped. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but that was uh, and uh, her lawyer, uh, her lawyer called our lawyer, and our lawyer. Uh, I think I don't know if what happened ultimately. To be honest, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really pay attention at the time. If I, if I, yeah, I can't. But we don't, we, we really don't worry about that too much, just because if we did, it would, you know, it would color our, it would color our writing too. The much. The First we Amendment, wanted. God bless it, and please everyone support it. I'm assuming you do because you know you're not throwing things at me. Um, covers a multitude of things, and satire is absolutely protected. Uh, one of the great onion spikes of awareness was when Bush was going to appoint a Supreme Court justice and he was going uh, to, he was looking at Harriet Myers, his own White House counsel, who turned out to be just a complete tomato can. Um, at that time, we had a weekly address from the president. We had a, we had a Bush impersonator on staff who was very good and who had a message from the White House uh, from the Oval Office every week, and we promoted this by having a little presidential seal. Harriet Meyer's office called us up, or sent us a letter actually, and said, please take that down. You're not allowed to use the seal of the president uh, for satirical purposes. And I think our response was, yes, we are, you evil biddy, or something like that. <laughs> And nothing more came of it, but we were smart enough to get that out into the press, and it was in the New York Times, and it was great, and we got a lot of supporting letters, and the evil biddy went away, and no one's ever heard of her since, so. Now is when she pulls back the curtain with a knife and uh, starts, like, oh, chasing us around. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Death by Harriet Myers. Uh, my name is Q, and I'd like to know, um, in the event that any of us in this room are listening to the subsequent broadcast, do you have any advice for our future selves? Uh, in the future, uh, wait, and for your future selves? Well, you already know about what happened at this point, so I'm not really sure if I can give you what any advice. What was your advice. name? I, I just, I'm Q, <laughs> okay. and I love to get advice when it's way too late, and it's an excellent opportunity. To oh, okay, okay. Uh, you know what? Janet was the one, and the trip, <laughs> yeah, and the, and the trip to the river, that was the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've, You'll be reasonably content with your life, but you'll never be truly happy now that you've let her go. And yes, he's, he's everything you never could be, but you know, she didn't know that at the time. So, well played. Thank you. Sure. Have you, have you or anybody else at The Onion ever been threatened with violence by people who don't have a sense of humor, like say... Well, not because of work. <laughs> Like say Scientologists or religious fundamentalists or we never have no. nothing. No. We've never actually been threatened with violence. I think people are. My dad has no sense of humor and used to threaten me with physical violence seven times a day. But, yeah. <laughs> but we, uh, I think people are faster to to work on litigation. And I think as as we've gotten as we've gotten bigger, people have been less like people just sort of like uh, you know people are less likely to do that now. So I, I you know but nobody's ever. No. Nobody's ever like physically threatened me. I think we've made fun of Scientology and we've made fun of a lot of. It's hard uh, to do. I mean, it's reasonably airtight, but we figure, hey, it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's our job to to poke fun at this uh, this this very scientifically proven uh, religion, Scienceology or Scientology. Uh, yeah, but no, it was, fortunately, nobody's. I mean, in bars, probably people have have not liked their, the tone of our voices and not liked the cut of our jib. Uh, but but that's about it but never professionally. Hi. Thank you. I guess a similar question going back to the headline you mentioned earlier about Obama, black men ask America for change. And then I also remember um, the headline you ran after he black won. Black men given nation's worst job. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, 
And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, did you have conversations about are we going too far with this? Are there different versions, harder versions, softer versions, and choosing, or do you just kind of go oh, we, for it? You, you always, we fiddle, we can't help but fiddle with the wording of every single thing we do. But the simplest possible thing was what you have to go with there. I mean, the early one was obviously people not being able to recognize or acknowledge the fact that a black man might be running for president. They're kind of stunned and kind of not sure how to feel about it. And the second one was, of course, there's a really terrible, terrible mess to clean up. Who does that in this country, you know, <laughs> historically? So that's what that's based on there. Um, as far as fiddling with it, yeah, I mean, we fiddle with everything. But we knew what we wanted to get out of it. We never said, oh, we, we can't, how dare we come and say that, you know, uh, that, that uh, they make black people clean things up in this country. You know, we ne it never would have occurred to us to ask that because uh, there is some evidence that that's the case. So. I can't wait for the first Mexican-American president. I really can't because we'll <laughs> be able to do that one again. Uh, do you ever just plain tell the truth and find that that's very funny? We have. Um, there was a story we ran once that was, uh, it was actually uh, a black guy photoshopped into uh, a college It was just called black ad. guy photoshopped in. Yeah. Yeah. And it was basically, it was actually based on a University of Wisconsin thing where it was a, it was a picture of some students and it was clear that uh, there was a black student that had been photoshopped into it to make it look like it was a like bad was job. Diverse. He was looking the wrong way, he was slightly larger, yeah. Yeah, and so that, I think that was a, and that was just a, I mean, you can make the comment uh, about how, you know, how people, how they were trying to make it, uh, you know, make it f uh, falsely appear more diverse and trying to. marketing their diversity. Right. Yeah. Uh, marketing diversity in what is not a particularly not a terribly diverse campus, um, but uh, yeah. So that was like, but that was like the facts were changed, but that was the the gist of it was was absolutely true. And we've done a couple other things, but I can't like not very often. Like we we really try not to do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, usually it's just for the purposes of a commentary. Like, uh, uh, what was the headline for his obituary? Strom Thurmond finally finally dies. <laughs> is one. Um, Oh, and then there's also the, uh, the, I mean, this is maybe, this is close. It was sort of like the year end, re the year in review for uh, 2006, and I think it was uh, uh, bastard, old bastard, dirty bastard, old dirty bastard dies. And it was uh, uh, old dirty bastard, Reagan. Uh, the filmmaker, Russ Meyer. Uh, Russ Meyer. And, and old dirty, yeah. And, and no. who was the fourth? I can't remember. But yeah, Bast so that was. Oh, yeah, some, some. Some horrible politician. Yeah, but it was. Uh, oh, so it was um, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> of all those people, was I couldn't remember. I got Russ Meyer over Saddam Hussein. Which, if you want to know, if you want to know about my background as a journalist, I think you do. <laughs> lack thereof. Um, yeah, but sometimes the truth, like I mean, that's the problem. Is like you sometimes the truth often trumps what we try to do. So, so usually we just leave it alone. Like <laughs> there's a lot of things we find it hard to comment on just because they're so silly to begin with, I mean, and of course now they're all escaping me. But. Right, that's the, that's the problem. I mean, the, 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 the gift of, the, of having, us, uh, having us here at the forum is that uh, together we have, uh, seven, what's 17 plus, uh, 17 plus 19? We have 36 years of experience between us. Uh, the curse is that uh, in 36, those 36 years we've forgotten, every, everything's sort of run together, and so we've forgotten a lot of the headlines. Um, so that's a downside. Yeah. But it, it's not unheard of, that's all I'll say. Okay. Zipping up, the zipping the lip. Zip. Okay. <laughs> this is actually sort of a follow-up to his question. I noticed that the New York Times a couple days ago kind of gave uh, the onion a nod for one of your headlines. It was a, it was an article about babies being social paths. And <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, does this happen often, or is this? It's nice to get the little the, to get the little nod. Like I, uh, their columnist Thomas Friedman used to love to quote the. Uh, our long national our nightmare. Our long national nightmare, peace and prosperity is finally over. Or you'll see, oh, once again, the onion called it, and then we did some silly headline that they are now talking about, oh, the Roomba is exactly what they were talking about. Um, and that's always nice to see ourselves quoted as being prescient, in which case we're just lucky. You know, but there, was a, there was one article that we wrote that, was, uh, that wound up being very prescient, uh, prescient and uh, that was... Uh, uh, this is going to have to be bleeped because there's no way to actually. I, I could I could dance around the swears, but really, it's it was an editorial by the. the is that okay? I mean, is for BBC, I don't know about for the broadcast. 
Oh. It could be bleep. It's okay. This is, re Don't this worry is recorded, about it. correct? Okay. Really? So, Cambridge. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it was a. Uh, it was, the, it was an article by the CEO of uh, Gillette, and it was called, Fuck Everything, We're Doing Five Blades. <laughs> this is three years before they actually had a five-bladed razor. Right, and that was like, it was really funny. It was like, I, I wrote it, and then uh, uh, Carol Kolb and Amy Bairdale were my editors at the time, and they just like, they just polished that to a sheen. It was a beautiful, like, that article is probably the, th the thing I want, I want the entire thing engraved on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> So, it was so, I'm so happy with that. And then they came out with a five-blade razor. And I was just like, well, there it goes. <laughs> and Joe gets in touch with them and said, hey, we called this uh, years ago. And their response was like, yeah, uh, we know. Yeah, <laughs> fine. And Joe's like, yeah, can we get, yeah, we'll send you the article. Can we get some, don't send us the article. We'll send you, we'll send you some razors. And they send like <laughs> one razor and two refills. Yeah, they were remarkably cheap. Uh, they could have actually sent a bunch of razors. I mean, those, are, those refills are expensive. Um, but yeah, uh, I, uh, to sum up, I am not uh, above uh, pandering for swag. Anyway. But, Although I think, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think, does that answer? We yeah. kind of got off track, but yeah, I mean, we are do. Gonna, I was just curious, are you going to do anything about, I mean, do you do any like recourse and like say anything back to the New York Times or write any articles? No, no. I, no not really. Would, I don't know what we would. Yeah, I don't know. There's no like back. That might look a little fawning. Okay. When Brian Williams used to quote us a lot, so we had him do the intro to one of our books. Oh, okay. That's so that's good. Yeah, because he's Brian Williams. You know, kind of handsome. He's guy. a handsome devil. Yeah, he sure is. Handsome devil Brian Williams said of the Onion. Um, <laughs> I don't know what exactly. But thank you. Hello. Hello, gentlemen. Um, I read The Onion pretty regularly. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Anybody and else? Oh. <laughs> a lot of the times, you know, I laugh out loud, and then sometimes there's humor that's just, like, really dark. We don't care about your personal problems. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, for example, uh, on the inauguration day of Barack Obama, or maybe the day before, you ran an article that was... Uh, George W. Bush passes away quietly in his sleep. <laughs> well, we've been killing him. Well, that wasn't anywhere near the, the end of it. We'd been killing him for a long time. We had a, <laughs> but we maybe, had a, like, maybe you could talk a little bit about that kind of dark humor. And, uh, oh, we were so tired of him. We were just having him die in terrible, grotesque ways. He fell on a running table saw. He was in a, he was in a helicopter accident, wasn't he? I think so, yes. Yeah, he belt sanded his face off. <laughs> he... Um, um, what else did he do? You can go in like Bush. He's always in critical condition, recovering at uh, at Annapolis Naval Hospital. Right. Uh, at the end of every single one of them, he's always in. But oh, it, the motorcade it, dragged him three miles. <laughs> motorcade. Uh. They didn't notice he'd slammed his leg. In the, <laughs> yeah. So by the by the end of that, I mean, it might not have been professional, but it was because it was funny. So we were just having him die and uh, or nearly die. He's because he's always recovering in terrible, terrible ways. So in the end, having him pass away quietly in his sleep was kind of like saying. Well, you know, Au revoir. coda. <laughs> there so. was there was a like actually one story we the the story we ran recently that got the most just virulent hate mail uh, we've gotten was and I the thing is like it was it wasn't even funny per se I'm not going to say it was like a laugh out loud thing but it was just sort of like it was it was extremely dark and it was a story that was a kidnapped boy rescued in mind of kidnapped boy. Uh, and the whole thing, it's like, and I liken it uh, to the little matchstick girl, uh, where at the end she dies. Uh, she like has the fantasies, she lights a match, she has the fantasies, and then at the end she dies. Well, that's kind of what happens in this, uh, except for he's a kidnapped boy instead. Um, and I don't, if you don't like uh, feeling horrible, I don't advise reading it, but if you like... Uh, if you like interesting, uh, interesting fiction, uh, we're not afraid to do some pretty dark stuff. Yes, if it's, if it's in the service of pointing out something interesting. Anyway, what were you guys trying to point out with the, the kidnapping? A complete lack of hope. <laughs> <laughs> we're nihilists. That's what we were trying to yeah. point out. All is darkness. <laughs> anyway, you'll never get to sleep again. <laughs> Do you ever feel that reality is offering a little bit of unfair competition for what you do? Reality is our fiercest competitor. Yes. Uh, well, them and two and a half men. <laughs> they're both, uh, they're both uh, wildly unpredictable, and they both star Charlie Sheen. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I mean, it's... I thought Charlie Sheen co-starred in reality. <laughs> Anyway. But he's always overshadowed by his father, Martin. Um, I don't know. Is it? Is it? 
I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes, yeah, we, we do compete with it. And sometimes we'll pitch jokes that just seem like they're just too close to, they skew too close to reality. And we can't really, uh, we can't really top it. So we just sort of let it, uh, we let the joke go. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, the thing is like we, but somehow we bravely persevere. We just, we hold our chins high and we just march ahead into, into nihilistic oblivion. We might not always have an easy week making jokes, but we're not gonna run out of things to make fun of anytime soon. It's, you know, reality will provide. And, uh, and even though sometimes, you know, we elect a president who's so unbelievably bumbling that it's hard to satirize them, you know, I think we'll muddle through somehow. So just let's not ever do that again, can we? <laughs> Is there a conservative counterpart to The Onion? Or part two of my question is, who's your audience? Do conservatives have a sense of humor? Oh, we're all John Birch Society members. <laughs> I mean, We're all staunch conservatives. You we're can take we're my, mad at Bush because he let down the side so much. You can take my gun when you pry it out of my cold, dead hands, frankly. Also, uh, I, don't, I don't believe you, you, you. Quit looking me right in the eyes. You are a woman. <laughs> The only reason I agreed to do this is because I admire your your city's history of witch trials so much. Um, I I don't think I mean I'm gonna I go think... across the street and burn down Harvard as soon as uh, we're done. Here, <laughs> I just trust higher learning, uh, but I promise that churches won't be touched. I don't know if there is a conservative counterpoint to uh, the Onion. I don't know that we're necessarily. I mean, we 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 try not to just skew too closely to a party line or to a doctrine. I mean, we have. Uh, it's not like we haven't picked on Democrats, for right. one thing, or anybody else who, you know, codifies a political point of view. So. But sometimes it's just like, I mean, our, you know, our motto is, you are dumb. Uh, or actually, it's, it's tu stultus est, which is, in Latin, you are dumb. Really bad Latin. <laughs> really bad Latin. If anybody knows better Latin, uh, please come uh, clarify that. Um, we're or not going to change our motto, though, because it's too late. If um, anybody could play the piano in Latin, that'd be <laughs> But uh, yeah, anyway, um, I don't think, I mean, but we try not to be too partisan. We, we try to like hand it out evenly, but sometimes it's just difficult to do because, uh, you know, right now, I mean, we were, when the Democrats were sort of flailing and they were like, you know, floundering to try to, uh, to, try to find direction, we would, you know, we would make fun of that. Uh, now the same thing is happening to the Republicans, so it's very easy to make fun of. And they've also chosen uh, one of the, uh, they also chose as a, a vice presidential running mate last time, Sarah Palin, and any party that does that is extremely deser deserving of scorn. And you can't, like, you can't, I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't, I mean, even from a nonpartisan standpoint, you can't say empirically yeah. uh, that there, that person is qualified to be a public official. Uh, is, she is didn't think so, she quit. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she I mean, has a new book coming out in November, a second book. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. Wow, now there's going to be a whole bunch of people out there who have only read two books. <laughs> Three. <laughs> um, what we try to make fun of is lack of human compassion, lack of imagination, willful stupidity, apathy, um, knee-jerk meanness, and an unwillingness to be flexible uh, mentally or spiritually, which is a very broad and high flute way of saying, we try to make fun of jerks. And if one party has a lot more cold-hearted jerks than the other, then they're going to be in for more of the stick. That's just the way it is. So if you sense that that's happening in our paper, maybe it's not you know, necessarily our fault. <laughs> it's not like we haven't made fun of Democrats uh, for being, you know, they, they, American politics tends to fall into the classic crime novel thing, where it's not so much good versus evil as strong versus weak. And it's a lot more fun to make fun of the strong than it is to pick on the weak. So um, the Republicans have been dealing from a place of strength for long enough that they've come in for more satire from us. Picking on the weak just kind of feels like almost useless. They're, they're weak. They're already picking on themselves. So yeah, but we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll make fun of anybody. I'm going to let this guy get to his question because <laughs> I think I'm really saying the same thing a lot. Um. Stand up straight, young man. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Would it have killed you to wear a tie? <laughs> Those shoes in church, really? <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> so I have a large collection of The Onion 
articles written at my house, and my, one of my favorite parts is the horoscopes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I was just wondering how on earth, who writes them, and how on earth do they think them up? Because they're new every time, and they're brilliant, and they're just the funniest things. Well, for years I wrote them, and then <laughs> he did. I did, and then Dan Guterman has written them for the past few years. And actually, lately, he's been rerunning some of my old ones, just so you know. So pay closer attention. Um, you, uh, how do you come up with them? This is dangerously close to the where do you get your ideas thing, which is always a, a question that tends to infuriate creative people. Um, but the only answer to that is you'd sit and you try to think of horoscopes. You try to, you start with the idea of a horoscope. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's all it is. You start with the idea of a horoscope, and then you extrapolate that as best you can to someone getting hit by a bus or uh, a night journey halfway over water or a tall dark st- you will meet a tall dark stranger who will cut you up into tiny pieces deep fry you and digest you and, and you go from there um, there's a lot of it, the horoscopes are a great place for wordplay cruelty and making fun of people who you know look to arbitrary movements of you know astrological uh, bodies in order to tell their future so, so that's that would, it. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you like them. They're fun to write. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for the... I will pass along to Dan Guterman because he'll be thrilled to hear that because he's always... Uh, he's, on, he's also addicted to instant messaging and I'll, I'll open my computer and he'll be like, he'll be like, hey! As soon as I get on, I'll be like, ah! I was like, oh, what are you doing, Dan? He's like, scopes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the time. It's a constant, uh, it's a constant thing. But so he, he, genu- he genuinely will appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's nice to know that someone uh, sees even the smaller less promoted details of our paper, so. So any more questions, because we're about to finish and, and Joe and John will be here to sign books. It doesn't have to be one we wrote. I'm particularly, <laughs> fond, of, particularly fond of signing Hemingway books. I'll sign the works of Elmore Leonard, uh, but only in his voice. How dare you deface the works of Elmore Leonard? <laughs> this okay. is a great ending. How have you changed the world? How have we changed the world? The world? <laughs> A lot uh, of people say that they only get their news from The Daily Show and us and the Colbert, from fake news sources anymore. I don't believe that for a second because they wouldn't know what we're talking about. Uh, we do jokes based on the news, and if they don't know what the news is, uh, then they wouldn't get us. I think that, I don't know if comedy can change the world, but I think the comedy is really great at preaching to the choir. I think the comedy is great at lifting the spirits of people who already believe a certain way but think that it's hopeless. And now they think that, well, it's hopeless, but at least this comedy source also thinks it's hopeless, <laughs> so I'm not the only one. I think comedy's good at that. Comedy's good at piling on once, the, once the, the ship of popular opinion has started to change course. Comedy's really good at trying to, you know, jump right on there and help. And that's a great mixed metaphor. Comedy will hold you, uh, hold you and rock you to sleep at but, night. Yeah, comedy's not more important, I don't think, than lucid, careful, analytical thought about serious issues. I just think comedy can make that a little bit more bearable, actually. I think that's its purpose more than actually trying to affect societal change. I think it just helps societal change be easier. And it may be because you've actually changed endorphin and serotonin levels. That's <laughs> been more important than anything. Yeah. Oh, endorphin and serotonin levels. It reminds me, I have a, an article about brain chemistry due tonight. <laughs> Well, that reminds not me, I have really thoughts. bad levels of those, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we have to come to a close. I want to thank you for all coming to the Cambridge Forum. I want, you to, thank, I want to thank Joe Garden and John Krusen. Thank you. Krusen.